Welcome to Cars Yeah, show number two. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. All right, automotive enthusiasts, I am very excited to introduce to you my special guest today, Kevin Beard. Kevin, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? As always. Awesome. Good to see you, Mark. Good to talk to you. Great. It's awesome having you here. Thanks. Kevin is the principal of Kevin A. Beard Design. He's a designer and brand developer for lifestyle footwear and apparel, automotive aftermarket products, and motorsport personal safety equipment. Kevin graduated from the prestigious Art Center College of Design and worked for the world-famous Adidas, Reebok, and K-Swiss. He taught at the Academy of Art University in San Francisco. Kevin founded Pelodi Shoes in 1999. Pelodi was a unique automotive footwear company that was acquired by Canadian Tire Corporation in 2012. So, Kevin, I've told the listeners a little bit about you, so take a moment and share a little more about you, what you're up to these days, your interests, and your passion for automobiles. Well, it's good to be with you, as always, and, you know, you and I have known each other seemingly forever. In fact, I can't, I was thinking about this as we were tuning up for this, and I couldn't think back when we first met, and I think it was probably back uh, at a SEMA show sometime in the past, but... My kind of car life is lifelong, and probably a lot of your listeners and a lot of a lot of friends are as well. My mom says that the first words out of my mouth weren't "mommy" and "daddy," but "jaguar" and, uh, <laughs> or "jaguar" <laughs> or "jaguar." Because when I was a little kid, I had allergies, and I'd have allergy shots every week. And so, going to the doctor, I'd see in the doctor's parking lot there was this XKE. And so it just has been with me since, uh, you know, Corgi toys as a kid and and just a car guy can identify cars by sound. The whole thing that kind of runs with the classic, you know, birth to death car guy. Well, there's something else we have in common, Jaguar XKE. My first love for a sports car was a Jaguar XKE. My father had a friend who had one. And he took me to the hardware store and bought me the little red Cars by Lesney matchbox of the Jaguar XKE. And that was my first toy car. And getting a ride in that XKE was first. So we share share a beginning passion for automobiles. I think I was four years old. And then both of us eventually migrate to the dark side of Porsche. Of course. (laughs) Axis Motors. (laughs) No, but it, it's been a, a lifelong passion, and I love automotive history. Uh, obviously, I love design, and it's just been an evolutionary thing, too. I find myself going in not circles, but kind of ellipse, not concentric circles in a way, as my passions kind of ebb and flow over what car or what era I happen to be passionate about at any given moment, and that can change during the course of a single day. What's great is we met because of Pelodi Shoes. And the company I was working with at the time, we started buying Pelodi shoes and selling them. They were one of my favorite kind of shoes. I've still got many pair in my closet. And your design sense and your history with shoe wear and designing cars, you found a great way to combine automotive and your your passion and your love for design using the cars. I remember Pelodi shoes, a lot of the soles were modeled after the old Dunlop tires. So talk about merging your passion for design, your passion for cars into a product. It was fabulous. Well, it all started when, even when I was, um, had my first gig after Art Center, I wanted to do automotive interiors while I was at Art Center. And when I graduated, there weren't any interior gigs around. After I graduated Art Center, I was still trying to get an uh, automotive interior gig and was interviewing and made some contacts at BMW in Munich and got a job offer from Adidas up in uh, Nuremberg, sort of an hour and a half north of Munich. And so while I was at Adidas and thinking, you know what, uh, I'll still keep interviewing. This pays the bills, gets gets me into Germany. And uh, my wife and I moved there and we're starting to kind of settle in. Change happened while I was at Adidas. And it, Adidas sent me to the Geneva Auto Show and hooked me up with all this Olympic swag and first class air travel, well, business class air travel, rental car, great hotel. And I got to the show and was going to the show and I ran into some of my classmates from Art Center that had gotten jobs doing exteriors with uh, Daimler Benz and BMW and other German car companies. They all had to pay their own way to the show. 
uh, it was the executives that were there and the you know entry level people weren't able to go on the company's dime. And I thought, you know what, this is pretty interesting. Then shortly a while later, uh, sharing patents at Adidas and traveling around the world and stuff was getting produced. And I found out I was pretty good at doing footwear. So that kind of shifted me away from cars. And I ended up doing Olympic footwear and had athletes win Olympic medals and uh, running in track and field and, and just had a great time doing footwear. But always in the back of my mind, there was I wanted to do something entrepreneurial. And while I was at Adidas, we had signed Ayrton Senna. As, as an Adidas athlete. And so I ended up doing some shoes. Did you ever get to, to meet Ayrton? Unfortunately not. I did some shoes and he was supposed to come up to Nuremberg after, after um, Imola. Mm-hmm. And of course, that never happened. But still, and I should have brought them out for the interview because I could show them to you over Skype. But the I still have the shoes that I did. Oh my goodness. And that got me thinking about, you know what? Here is the largest group of spectators and the largest group of passionate individuals and there's really not a brand unless they're it's todd's or car shoe or somebody that made a driving moccasin on one hand very expensive can't wear them outside of the car and you're that guy and on the other hand we're race boots which you can't wear out of the car they're expensive they're relatively poor quality when you get right down to it and they're not innovative haven't been updated at all since bill simpson put nomex in a essentially a wrestling boot in 1968 and so this idea was germinating around in my head and when i left k swiss a few years later one of my buddies from adidas that i had contacted about doing a project with said you know maybe now it's time for you to to try and do this on your own and i've got some factories that we should talk to and so i started Pelodi just based on that and the simple fact that there was nobody talking to you and me and everybody that's listening to your show. There was nobody talking to car guys authentically about car culture and a knowledge of car culture and and not just sticking what looked like plastic scoops onto a shoe and calling it, you know, something automotive and stuff, you know. <laughs> sure. So actually making something that was authentic and that's how it all started. Wow. Well, that's a great story for inspiring entrepreneurs because you find something that people need and you feel that need. And right. I remember seeing one of your first print ads that triggered me to give you a call to say, wow, this guy speaks to me. I'm a car guy. I've never seen shoes like this that you could wear outside the car because at the time I was racing vintage cars. And you're right. You can't wear those driver's shoes outside the car. They'll kill your feet. There's no soul to them. And you did exactly that. So that's a that's an awesome story for our listeners, especially those that want to get into an entrepreneurial field around their passion of look for that opening just like on a racetrack and dive into the corner yeah the one the one caveat i I would offer from an entrepreneurial standpoint is sometimes it's no one's going to know your business better than you but sometimes you can get a little bit forest and trees and so looking at the customer i always believed that serving my customer was serving you and me and and the guys that were actually wearing the shoes rather than really kind of having to perhaps dumb down your product a little bit in in order to get retailers to accept it because a lot of retailers won't accept something new because it's new and untested and they're not used to being involved in new and untested as much as they give that lip service that's actually not the truth uh, i would give that as a caveat and as as a warning to all budding entrepreneurs uh, great advice kevin thank you this part of the show we like to ask about an inspirational quote, a mantra, or a person that was instrumental in forming your passion for cars. It's a great way to get the inspirational tires turning here at Cars Yeah. So Kevin, take the wheel. Well, one of the critical things came up when I first started Pelodi. I had become friends over the years with a guy named, um, was the founder of Simple Shoes, a guy named Eric Meyer. And Eric's a big Volkswagen guy. And I asked Eric about starting his company and starting his shoe company and what the challenges were. And he, he gave me this simple advice. And it was, it's like driving a truck. Starting your own company is like driving a truck. If you stop to fix everything that falls off or breaks, you can't drive the truck. If the truck still moves with the broken bit, drive the truck. No matter what happens, drive the truck. And that was great advice to keep driving no matter what, unless some unless you hit something. Keep driving because if it if it's not as important as you thought it was. So drive the truck. That is incredibly 
strong advice and something that I've heard over and over with entrepreneurs is they wait to start things because everything has to be perfect. They, If everything isn't exactly right or along the way something falls off the truck, as you said, they stop and that falters. Yep, keep driving. Just keep driving. Exactly right. Yeah, excellent. Good advice. Yeah, it is great advice. So how have you incorporated that mantra into your life, your passion for cars, your business? Well, on the business side, it kept uh, Pelodi going in the face of recession and uh, monumental changes in production in China. But at the end of the day, it, it actually couldn't overcome adversarial people. And one of the other things, too, is trying to dri- keep driving the truck and apply to your personal life, too. A lot of times as an entrepreneur, you end up getting really close to your to your company and identifying with it. And in my case, you can get so closely identified with it that it kind of usurps your personality. You can kind of lose yourself as a result. And that's a bit of a warning and a bit of a wake up call. But yeah, I'm still here, still driving the truck, looking at starting something new. Got a couple of things uh, that I'm working on right now, whether it's buying a brand or uh, starting another one from scratch. And uh, so we'll see what happens over the next few months. Well, it's a powerful message for our listeners. And I really appreciate appreciate you sharing that with them. Uh, I think it'll resonate with a lot of people. Is there a, a moment in time that you can think back to, and you touched on it a little bit with the XKE going to the doctor, that was a pivotal moment in your life when you knew you were an automotive enthusiast? I don't think there was ever a time where I didn't know. I think that when I was, very, you know, sort of 11, 12, 13, 10, at 10, we moved from Canada to the United States, so completely new environment. And I happened to find a guy down the street who was a Chevy guy. And at the time, I was kind of a Ford guy. Uh, this was the time of, you know, Ford Mustangs and Trans Am. And, and uh, that was a big thing for me. I was a big McLaren guy, and I knew they ran big block Chevys, but I kind of separated that out. But there was this kind of Ford and Chevy battle that was fought out on the, the plains of this little hill we lived on in Washington State. And his family was all Chevy and GM and mine was all all Ford. And I guess that's when it kind of really gelled that this is really a passion and I know and I'm learning a lot more about it. I started acquiring books and and, uh, just reading all the time and and it kind of gave me an identity and a separation point that was very natural and organic compared to everyone I knew. And so I guess at that point, I knew I was a car guy. That was the moment. Yeah. This next part of the conversation is always powerful for listeners, and I want to take, I want you to take us down your journey and really crawl under the hood and maybe get your hands a little dirty and share a huge challenge that you faced, whether it be with a business endeavor or maybe a specific automotive project that really pushed you to a breaking point and how you overcame that situation, how you crawled out from underneath that, that dirty engine and, uh, move forward. Well, I hate to, to make the, this uh, discussion or this interview about, uh, kind of Palodian business and overcoming stuff, but that's that's been so much a, a part of my life that it has to be that simple thing. And um, overcoming the obstacles that were thrown up, whether it was production or funding or raising capital, it became trying to overcome things on a daily basis. And I think that if you start to try and take off and take too big a bite out of things, if you can keep things down and management books and self-help books tell you this all the time, keep it down to small bites. But it's absolutely true because if you try and take off too big a bite, whether personally or in business or even as a car guy, you know, if you look at that car in the garage for a long time, I had a 914, it sat in the garage and I just thought, oh God, it's just Uh, I don't even want to tackle it. But doing little tiny things kind of makes things go and suddenly you've got a whole bunch of things done. And I think that that in and of itself is probably the best thing in life as a car guy, that if you've got you know, a project that you want to do, don't try and do it all at once because it'll it'll overwhelm you like a tsunami. But if you can take little bites and do little pieces, then suddenly it keeps your passion going. And I think that's important because if, even if you're a car guy that's completely passionate, it's easy to get overwhelmed if you've got a project that is, you know, major. Oh, absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head there. There's a, the acronym KISS, keep it simple, silly. Yeah. And yep. uh, or focus, uh, follow yeah. one course until successful. And I agree with you. I've had the same issue with projects. There's been cars I've had in the past that I was in love with, and then I hit a stumbling block. I was about. I just would go. I'm done. I want to sell this thing. I'm moving forward. And then somebody would step in and help, some resource of some kind, and all of a sudden, oh, I'm in love again. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think that's a that's wonderful advice. Is keeping it simple, focus, and that keeps the passion alive for sure. Exactly right. Oh, so, great, Kevin. Let's shift gears and go 
going to another end of the spectrum here where you had an aha moment in your business where you took some steps and things really turned and you went, oh my gosh, I've got something viable here. This this could be real, uh, something that evolved into a success. Well, one of the main things was when we started getting emails and, and customers sending us photographs of what they were doing wearing Peloti. And it was not just here I am at the track, here I am driving. It was here I am wearing my Peloti prototipos and I'm hanging beneath my chute at 10,000 feet. And here's a photograph of my feet and the clouds below and the earth below that. Oh, I gosh. Wear them, I wear them all the time. It's a GoPro and moment. <laughs> total GoPro. And this was before GoPro. I mean, this was you know a decade ago. But what the big aha moment was, was I've, I've reached these people where the brand has become part of them. And it kind of shifted how I thought about it. I originally thought Peloti, the drivers, you know, is what it means in Italian. But it really became the brand wasn't about the shoes. It wasn't about the company. It was about the drivers, the, the gently lowing herd of, of enthusiasts out there who had taken us in and it's all they wore. It's It became a, a self-identifier. One of one of our buddies, and I, you know Steve Fields from Mazda Raceway Laguna Seca, once told me that he was at a baseball game in New York with his son and standing in line to get into, I forget, Giants or I forget what stadium it was going into. And he's standing in line and the guy next to him has on a pair of Pelotis and so does he. And they both look down at simultaneously point fingers at one another and go, what do you drive? And they had this conversation, ended up having a beer together. And it be- it was because, oh, you're in my tribe. You're one. Of- you're like me. I know you. That was the aha moment. And it became very, very humbling for all of us, for Darlene and me especially, when people would just come up and say, well, thank you for this because it, it is my identity. And that was extraordinarily humbling. Well, and I think I was one of the people that sent you some pictures. I first time I went to the Indy 500, I took a picture of Michael Andretti yep. wearing Pelotis and sent it to you from there. I did it again when I saw Peter Brock, and I know yep. him. He loves wearing your shoes. He has a closet yeah. full of them. So uh, that's great. And that is a wonderful aha moment when you really realized you touched the heartstrings. In fact, I, I'm not sure if I ever told you this story. I was at the Ducati factory in Italy, and I was with a group of people to tour the factory, and they separated me because this group was a bunch of young kids. They were really rowdy. And the lady said, well, let's let's go over here. And they put me with two other gentlemen. I looked down and they both had your shoes on. And we were instant friends. We ended up having some beers after the factory tour and talking in Bologna. And um, yeah, it's part of the tribe. So great story. Fantastic. Yeah, it, uh, it was very... It's extraordinarily humbling. It's the only way I can put it. Well, that's wonderful. Kevin, what was your first car, and what kind of fun did you have with that car? Maybe trips, modifications, adventures, memories? Well, it was more aspirational than inspirational. Um, My first car was a Fiat 124 Coupe. Oh, my goodness. And um, it was a rebuilt total, and it was what was affordable at the time. This was 78, 78. Mm-hmm. And uh, I worked at a body shop after after school, and so I painted it and uh, molded a, a kicktail spoiler into the deck lid, and uh, painted some go fast stripes on the side of it, and uh, color coded the wheels, and uh, lowered it, and put it, you know all the typical things you do as a kid. But it, it was aspirational from the standpoint of I loved the shape, that Bertoni shape, and it was. The poor man's uh, Bertone Dino Coupe, you know, Fiat Dino Coupe. Oh, sure. (laughs) And uh, but here, you know, at this point in time, everything around me, everybody that I knew was driving drum brake cars, you know, American stuff, or maybe they had disc brakes in the front and, you know, just horrible build quality. And here I was driving this little car that would rev its nuts off and four-wheel disc brakes, over dual overhead cams, a five-speed, and I could slide it, I could, you know, spin it out, learn how to drive with that car, and loved the shape. And, you know, it's been... That really informed my passions from then till now, I think. I, I'm more inclined to look at cars from the standpoint of, does it fulfill kind of the mission statement and does that ex- does that mission statement excite me more than oh it's the latest supercar and god it's beautiful i want i want to have a car that i can that can do things and so it's still that way today oh that's great wonderful story 
Are there any cars that you've had in your past that you wish you still owned? <laughs> There's the cars that I wish I would have bought. No, uh, I didn't no, ask that, that I, question. <laughs> <laughs> There's the one that I, I sold our uh, 71 911 um, hot rodded coupe to help start Pelodi, and I wish I still had that car. Not oh, because yes. the prices have gone insane, but... It was Albert Blue, which is this dark, dark navy that has kind of purple tones in it. So during the day, it's kind of it's this kind of blueberry blue. And then at night, it shifts through the purple range in California to almost black at night. And um, that was a wonderful car. Lightweight. Uh, yeah, that was the one that uh, I wish I would still have. All right. Well, I've got a, a similar story, as you know. So yep. those early 911s, yeah, I wish they, they were. They get in your blood, and man, they're hard to get out. Yep, yep. And hard to get back in the garage now, considering the prices. <laughs> yes, they are. <laughs> is, there a, uh, is there a current project that you're working on right now that really has you excited? Uh, Business-wise, yes. Automotively, everything's kind of on hold until the new business projects pan out. So, well, What's the business project? Uh, well, I'm looking at starting another automotive type brand, but not in the same way as Pelodi. Mm-hmm. Uh, trying to make stuff in the U.S., but if I can't, I'll have to go abroad. It's uh, frustrating that I can't just have my selection of manufacturers here in the United States to make uh, leather goods, but it's that's just the way it is. Well, we could uh, have an entire show about uh, getting more more manufacturing back, back in this yeah. country. Yeah, but that that's going to be a great project if it comes together. I've, uh, um, I've got the sketches all done, the technical drawings. Um, I've got the name. Uh, I've just got to try and keep it all together until I'm ready to launch it, and you'll be the first to know well can't wait to hear about it and uh i'm sure it's going to be awesome if i know the kind of design work you do and the ideas you have so yeah Uh, what's your favorite way to spend time with cars is it wrenching on them is it driving them restoring them detailing them well being kind of an omnivore i prefer the driving to anything else i'm really a checkbook mechanic i try very hard to be a good mechanic but I'm, i'm i'm one of those guys that hasn't done it enough i know the theory behind it Mm-hmm. <laughs> but it seems that whenever I try and fix something, it takes three or four times as long as everybody else says it should. But there you go. Um, but no, I love the driving more than anything else. I've spent a lot of time practicing, a lot of time at uh, Bob Bondurant trying to get better. And uh, But that's really where it's at for me. It's it's the whether it's on a two-minute blast on a back road in a canyon here near the house or whether it's a long road trip. I just love being in a car and having having adventures. That's to me what it's all about. It's what it's like I said earlier, what you can do with a car. It's the adventure of being in a car and going wherever I want, whenever I want, how I want, in any weather. I just love being behind the wheel. It's where I can think. It's where I relax. It's where I scare myself. It's all of those things. It's all those emotions. It's really the only place that I feel that. Well, fabulous. And that is the American dream with the automobile. It really means freedom. Yeah, it is. And that's what it sounds like for you. So, Kevin, uh, we're coming into one of my favorite parts of the talk I call The Last Lap. And this is where I fire off a series of questions, and you give our listeners quick blips of the throttle answers. So, are you ready? As ready as I'll ever be. Okay, here we go. What is the best automotive advice you've ever received? Buy a car that you love, not one that you're going to settle on for price or because it almost meets the need. Perfect. Can you share one of your personal habits that you believe contributes to your success? Make your bed every morning. <laughs> there you go. Your mom's smiling right now. <laughs> Do you have a resource that you would like to share with our listeners, either maybe a website, a supplier, a restoration shop, a person? Um, David Bull Publishing. Ah, um, yes. David is, uh, in fact, he called me today. The uh, Anything from his catalog, it pretty much fills my bookcase. Oh, and yeah. It's reference quality beautiful if you love cars then you have to have bull publishing books in your in your bookcase yeah, absolutely in fact we're going to have david on the show uh very soon and i can't wait to uh to listen to to what he has to say he's a fantastic publisher and i too have many many of his books on my shelf in fact if anybody's uh shopping for me for christmas that's the place to go yep i agree is there speaking of books kevin is there a a book in particular that you'd like to really share with our listeners, maybe a business book or reference book that you've really found useful? Well, again, it's it's any one of David's books, but being an endurance racing 
fanatic. Time in Two Seats is an incredible reference material and incredible reference book. That would be one of my top choices. The other would be Porsche Excellence Was Expected, Ludwigsen. Yes. You know, that group, that series of books. But basically those two compendiums will set you up for a lot of a lot of evenings with a, uh, a good cigar, increasing your knowledge. Exactly. Well, and listeners, what we'll do is we'll, uh, we'll post these resources on the website. You can find them on the show notes under carsyad.com slash Kevin Beard. Okay, Kevin, this part of the conversation, we're nearing the end, and it's what I like to call the checkered flag. Kevin, uh, this last question can be a challenge to people to quote a great automotive mark. It's a real doozy. If you could have only one collector car in your garage, something that you couldn't sell to buy other cars with, what would it be and why? Yeah, this is a really tough one because, like I said, I bounce back and forth during the day. <laughs> one collector car. I know. That's why it's the uh, checkered flag. It is the checkered flag. <laughs> okay. If it's just one and I had to look at it in the garage every day, drive it occasionally, and it's a pure fantasy, there's a Pininfarina bodied. Uh, Alfa Romeo 8C 2.9 mm. and it's it's gunmetal gray in its most recent iteration. Every time I see that car, I just get weak in the knees and it's the only car that, that really does that for me and that would have to be the one. All right. Well, we'll see if we can find a picture of that or maybe, Kevin, you can send me a picture of that car and we can post it on your show notes page so everyone can see what that looks like. I believe I know the car you're talking about because you've shared that with me before and it is absolutely gorgeous. Oh. Wonderful. Well, Kevin, you've taken us on a, a great ride today, and I've really enjoyed your stories. I want to thank you for sharing your journey with me and with our listeners. Uh, if you could just give us one parting piece of guidance before you drive off into the sunset and let our listeners know what's the best way they can learn more about you and your business and get a hold of you, and then we'll say goodbye. Well, we'll see what happens with one of the new brands, but keep your eyes and ears peeled, and uh, we'll have something out hopefully by the end of the year. But other than that, I think they're meant to be driven. Don't leave them in the garage. That's great advice. Is there a, a website people can go to to find you right now? Not yet. Not until I get this new thing launched. I'm kind of keeping everything on the down low until until we're ready to go. Okay. Well, when you're ready for that, I'll make sure we update the show notes so people can find you, okay? Appreciate that. Thank you. So, listeners, you can find links to everything we've talked about today here at carsyad.com, and you can search the show notes page for Kevin's story. Kevin, I want to thank you for being so generous with your time, your expertise, and sharing your experiences with our listeners. And until we talk again, we'll see you down the road. Thanks, Mark. Always a pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to carsyad.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!